We're beginning a new series of Sabbath School lessons titled The Great Controversy. If you were asked what theme runs through the entire Bible, what would you say? Jesus, the plan of salvation, the cross? Certainly these are all correct. But actually, what theme ties them all together? It's the great controversy. Now, you no doubt are familiar with the book, The Great Controversy, written by Ellen White. This series of Sabbath School lessons is based solidly on the Bible, but the readings of Great Controversy add insight and wisdom. They're corollary readings, so each lesson of this quarter will have a reading from The Great Controversy. I quote also quite extensively from it. So if you have the book Great Controversy, I would encourage you to look at your Sabbath School lesson and follow along with the chapters that I've outlined that go along with the particular lessons. After the first lesson, we will cover the book pretty much uh, chapter by chapter, section by section in Great Controversy. But again, the lessons were all based on Scripture. Now, when we think about the Great Controversy theme, what are we thinking about? What is that really speaking about? It's speaking about Eden lost to Eden regained. It talks from even before Eden lost. It talks about Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer in heaven, the fall of Adam and Eve, the plan of salvation in the sanctuary system, the coming of Christ, early New Testament Christianity, the apostasy that came into the church, the Reformation, the rise of the Advent movement, the last day events, and the coming of Christ. So this is going to be a very comprehensive series of Sabbath school lessons. Let's just dive right into our first lesson titled The War Between All Wars. You know, as I've traveled the world and people have asked me one question above all others, and that's this. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Why is there so much sickness and suffering and heartache in our world? If God is love, why does he allow it? If God is all-powerful, why doesn't he stop it? Although we may never have a full, complete answer to all of those questions until eternity, we can get answers that satisfy the mind and also speak to the heart. It all begins with a war in heaven. The reason there's war on earth is because it was first war in heaven. We go to Revelation chapter 12. We find this in Sunday's lesson. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. What a strange place for war. Was it, isn't that true? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was any place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now notice a number of things in this passage. First, there are two sides, Satan and the evil angels, Christ and the good angels. They come into conflict, they battle, they war. And the Bible says they did not prevail. Isn't that incredible good news? Evil never prevails, never triumphs in the face of Christ and righteousness. See, evil is not going to triumph. Wickedness is not going to triumph. Sin is not going to triumph. Satan is not going to triumph. It did not prevail. Jesus prevailed. Jesus triumphed. Jesus was victorious. Satan and the evil angels were cast out of heaven. If that's true in heaven, it's also true in your life, my friend, that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the eternal I am, will prevail in your life. As we open our hearts to him, Jesus casts out the demonic forces that try to destroy us. There's no temptation taken unto man, but is common to man. That God is faithful who won't allow you to be tempted above what you're able. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Notice it says the great dragon, verse 9, was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Notice it uses two terms for Satan. He's the dragon and he's the serpent. He's the dragon because he wants to destroy you. And he's the serpent because he wants to deceive you. He, so the deceiver is a destroyer and the destroyer is one who deceives. Now there's something significant, very significant about this. The question we ask is this, 
why? Why did it happen? Why did God allow this rebellion in heaven? Did a loving God create a demonic angel that initiated the war in heaven? Was there some fatal flaw in this angel that allowed him to rebel? Now, the Bible clearly explains this in Ezekiel chapter 28, and you'll find that in the middle of Sunday's lesson. Ezekiel chapter 28. Was there some fatal flaw in Satan that caused him to rebel? Did God make a mistake when he created Satan? Not at all. 28 verse 12 and onward. Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre is a representation of Satan and evil. And say to him, thus says the Lord, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Notice he's the seal of perfection. Um, verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Certainly not the king of Tyre. Certainly that it represents Satan. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Notice verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. You were perfect in all of your ways. But what happened? There was a fatal choice that Satan made. Satan allowed pride to well in his heart. He allowed pride to develop in his life. And that pride led him to something. What it led him to do, Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14 says, Lucifer says, I will ascend into the heights of the Most High. I will be like the Most High. I'll ascend into the clouds. I'll set my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. What's the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north? It's Mount Sinai. Satan wants to sit on God's throne. He wants to command rather than be commanded. And he claims that God is unfair, God is unjust. He claims that God is a vindictive tyrant and a wrathful authoritarian leader. Why did God allow him the power of choice? If you look at Sunday's lesson under the next couple paragraphs, it says, God did not create a devil. He created a being of dazzling brightness named Lucifer. This angelic being was created perfect. Included in his perfection was the freedom of choice, a fundamental principle of God's government, which runs by love, not coercion. Sin originated with Lucifer in heaven itself. There's no logical explanation why this perfect angel should have allowed pride and jealousy to take root in his heart and grow into rebellion against God. So the reason Lucifer rebelled is because God gave him the power of choice. If you take away the power of choice, you take away the ability to love. And if you take away the ability to love, you take away the ability to be happy. So God didn't want robot beating, beings. He didn't want mere mechanical machines. He wanted beings that loved him and cared for him. It was not like that Satan just rebelled once and God said, you're out of heaven. There's a marvelous statement in the book, Great Controversy, page 494 and 495, it's one you won't want to miss. It's on the bottom of Sunday's lesson. The heavenly councils pleaded with Lucifer. The Son of God presented before him the greatness, the goodness, and the justice of the Creator and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven and departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. So it wasn't that just Satan made some light mistake. It was rather that his pride welled up in his heart. God appealed to him again and again and again. It was that in the councils of heaven, in mercy and love, Christ himself, and the Father, the Holy Spirit, appealed to Lucifer to turn from his way he could have been forgiven initially, but he turned his back on love, turned his back on God's appeals, and he went into rebellion against God. 
Now, Satan was extremely deceptive. We go to um, Monday's lesson, Lucifer deceives, Christ prevails. Um, there's no logical explanation for why Lucifer, this perfect angel, should have allowed pride and jealousy to take root in his heart and grow into rebellion against his creator. Satan's pride ripened into open rebellion. He accused God of being unjust and unfair. He infected the angels with his doubts and accusations. Now, Satan is so persuasive. He was so persuasive in heaven. Look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Satan is so cunning, the Bible says, his tail, that's the dragon's tail, Satan's tail, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. That harmonizes with Revelation chapter 12 that says that uh, Satan who deceived the whole world, verse 9, was cast at the earth and his angels were cast with him. Here's the point. One third of the angels were cast out of heaven with Lucifer. One third of them. He must be cunning and deceptive. Here's the other thing to keep in mind. In heaven, every angel had to make a choice. They had to make a choice who their leader was. They had to make a choice that would impact their eternal destiny. Would they be followers of Christ or followers of Lucifer? Satan was so cunning that he deceived a third of them. What was the basis of his deception? The basis of his deception was God doesn't love you. He's an authoritarian dictator. He's made laws for your obedience only because he wants you to serve him, not out of your interest, but his self-interest. A third of the angels bought into that lie, that it was not necessary to obey. And men and women are buying into that lie today living in harmony with the dictates of their own conscience, their own feelings, their own emotions, with no standard of righteousness except their own head. As it says in Isaiah 53, everyone turned to his own way. As it says in the book of Judges, everybody did right in their own eyes. And so the challenge you have here in the rebellion is that one third of the angels listen to Satan's lies. Now, the loyal angels chose to be obedient in, to Christ's loving commands. Now, you might say, well, was this war in heaven just a war of ideas, or was it a physical contact combat as well? We really don't have that specific information, but it seems to me when I look at it, and I look at the language, it certainly is a mental combat. It certainly is a, a war of uh, spiritual warfare. Um, but also, there has to be some physical element to it because as Satan and his evil angels were cast out of heaven. So there has to be some kind of physical fight there, physical struggle there. The struggle between good and evil continues today. The struggle between Christ and Satan continues today. And, if, and when we make decisions to follow Christ, there is a battle, there is a march, there is a struggle against the powers of evil. Satan is cast out of heaven. How does planet Earth become involved in this conflict? Did God create Earth just as a dumping off place for Satan? He says, hey, I want to get rid of this evil angel. I'm just going to cast him out to Earth. Not at all. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that God looked upon everything that he had done, and it was good. When was Satan cast out of heaven? Before God created the Earth or after? It appears, we know for certain, that Satan was not cast out into the earth when Adam and Eve were initially created. Why? Because everything God does is perfect, and he looks at the earth and he says it's good. So God creates this perfect earth with shining, the sun shining and blue skies and the birds chirping and flowers blooming and fruit trees laden with fruit and babbling brooks singing through the landscape. The earth is carpeted with living green and it's just magnificent. But God places within that garden the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God would give Adam and Eve the same choice he gave the heavenly beings. They were not to be robot beings. They were to have the freedom of choice. They were to have the capacity to choose. And Eve comes to the tree, joined eventually by Adam, and she says, Adam, 
Look what I have in my hand. Satan said to me, you can eat of this tree and you will not surely die. I've eaten it. Satan said, you'll enter into a higher sphere of existence. God is keeping something from you. God is restrictive. You don't have to obey. Lucifer lost heaven because of disobedience. Adam and Eve lost the garden because of disobedience. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin separates us from God. Sin brings about sickness and suffering and, and sorrow and heartache and death. Genesis 3, verse 1 to 3, tells the story. And the Hebrew verb is quite an interesting verb because, you know, you may have always wondered, well, they ate of the tree and they didn't die immediately. That's true, they didn't. The death sentence was immediately passed upon them. They would die. But Genesis 3, verse 1, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now notice God said the day you touch it, you'll die. Well, she touched it, she didn't die that day. The Hebrew verb is interesting. It says, the day you touch it, dying, you will die. Dying, you will die. Immediately when she took that fruit, immediately when she ate it and Adam ate it, they began to die. The cells in their body began to deteriorate. The physical frame that God had given to them began to lose its vital force. Everything about them at that point, the aging process set in. Immediately then, they were destined for death. The death sentence was over their head. What would God do? Would he push the planet further out into space and destroy it totally? What would God do? How would God relate to the open sin of Adam and Eve, deceived by Lucifer? There in that garden, God came. He said, Adam, Eve, where are you? He is the God who comes looking for his lost children. He is the God that comes asking, where are you, son? Where are you, daughter? Are you hiding behind some, fig uh, some bush? Come out into the light of my love because there's grace and mercy for you. And there in that garden, we have the first promise of the Messiah. In Genesis 3, verse 15, the scripture says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, that's a separation. I'll put a conflict between you, uh, Satan, and the woman, that is humanity. And between your seed and her seed, he, that is the Messiah, shall bruise your head, Satan, but you'll bruise his heel. Christ would come on Calvary's cross. And that would give to Satan a deadly blow. Jesus would say on the cross, it is finished. The payment for sin is made. Jesus, on that cross at Calvary, paid the full price for the sins of humanity. In his life, he defeated Satan. In his life, he revealed what God was like, a God of love. On the cross, he gave Satan a death blow, showing that the wages of sin are death. In his resurrection, he showed that Christ had conquered death and that all of us could live once again. That leads us to Wednesday's lesson, Love Finds a Way. Love finds a way. First paragraph, Wednesday's lesson, Adam and Eve have sinned and God has told them that they must leave their garden home. From now on, toil and suffering will be their lot. Will they have to suffer and finally die with no hope? Is, the end of, is this the end of every, everything? Certainly not. God had given them the promise in Genesis 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman, of course, is Jesus Christ. Christ would come. According to Hebrews 2, verse 9, notice... See, if Jesus doesn't die, we must die eternally. If Jesus doesn't bear the sins of humanity, we must bear our own sins. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Let's look at a few texts on the magnificence of the cross, the beauty of the plan of salvation. Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus. Who do we see? Jesus. We don't see our guilt, our shame, our condemnation. We don't face death without hope. We see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Jesus tasted death for you and me. He tasted death for all humanity. All of us, saint and sinner alike, all of us have been redeemed on the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ. But you say, does that mean everybody's going to be saved? Not at all. Christ has made the provision through the redemption on the cross, but unless you and I accept what he has done, if we walk away from what he has done, if we turn our back on what he has done, if we don't choose to receive what he has done, well, we can't be saved. He has tasted death for whom? For every man. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He who knew no sin, did Christ ever sin? Never. Became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who knew no sin became sin. He took upon himself the sins of the world, the whole world on the cross of Calvary. All the condemnation and guilt of the sins of the world rested upon him and it crushed out his life. Galatians 3 verse 13, it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree. So Jesus took the curse of the all humanity sin on the cross. Redemption is for all. But you and I have the choice, the same choice that the angels had in heaven, same choice that Adam and Eve had when they went to the tree. Will we choose to accept his love? Will we choose to accept his redemption? Will we choose to accept the salvation that he has given so freely for us? He has given us the power of choice. Look, Monday's lesson, the last part, when God created humanity, he embedded deep within our brains the ability to think, to reason, to choose. The essence of our humanness is our ability to make moral choices. We're not robots who are created in God's image, distinct from the animal creation. Back now to Wednesday's lesson. I want to emphasize all the way through this lesson, God has given to us the power of choice. In the great controversy between good and evil, Jesus has done everything he could to save us. Satan has done everything he could to see that we're lost. The choice is ours. God reaches out to us. He takes the initiative in our salvation. God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit, bringing conviction to our hearts of what is right and drawing us to the right. But the choice must be ours. I love the note at the bottom of Wednesday's lesson, do you ever wonder if God really loves you? Look at the cross. Look at the crown of thorns. Look at the nails in his hands and feet. With every drop of blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, God is saying, I love you. I don't want you to be, I don't want to be in heaven without you. Yes, you've sinned. You've sold yourself into the hand of the enemy. Yes, in and of yourself, you are unworthy of eternal life. But Jesus says, I've paid the ransom to get you back. When you look at the cross, you never have to wonder again whether you are loved. Christ died for us, but Christ lives for us. Thursday's lesson, our great high priest, Jesus hangs on the cross of Calvary. It is finished. Death, the death blow to Satan has been given. The ransom for sin has been paid. But what if you had the cross with no resurrection? What if you had the cross with no resurrection and ascension? What if there was no high priestly ministry of Christ? What if Christ simply died on the cross and never came out of the grave? He would have then been a good martyr, but not the divine son of God. The resurrection of Christ is one of the great evidences of Christ being divine. The tomb is empty. Christ is alive but he comes out of that too. And there in the great controversy between good and evil, he died for us and he lives for us. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Jesus died for us. Jesus lives for us. It's all for us, my friend. Here, Hebrews 7, verse 25 Therefore he is able. What is he? He's able. Therefore he's able. Able to do what? 
to save to the uttermost those that come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is able to save you to the uttermost. But what must we do? We must come. Come to God through Jesus. He ever lives to make intercession for us. You know, there's nothing more that Jesus wants than your eternal salvation. In John chapter 17, we have Christ's final prayer. This is the great intercessory prayer of Christ. John chapter 17. You're looking there at verse 24. This is the heart longing of Christ. John 17, verse 24. Father, I desire. He's praying. He's pleading. What is his desire? Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. That, I, that they may behold my glory, which you've given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus lives for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And he says, Father, I desire. This was his prayer on earth, and it's his prayer in the heavenly sanctuary above. These were his last words on earth, and they're his words today. Father, I desire. Father, I wish. Father, I want my people to be with me through all eternity. This week's lesson shows that God gave Lucifer the power of choice. God gave Adam and Eve the power of choice. God gives to you and me the power of choice. God has done everything he could in Christ through the Holy Spirit to save us. But today, the choice is ours to receive what Jesus has done. He wants more than anything else for you to be in heaven. But the choice is yours. It's mine. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts for the glory of knowing that we can be in heaven with you one day. You've done everything possible to save us, Father. Jesus came, lived the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, was resurrected from the tomb, lives in heaven as our great intercessor, as our great high priest. Now, my Father, we praise you that you want to save more than we want to be saved. We open our hearts to you just now and choose to receive your love, your grace. We choose to be on your side in the great controversy between good and evil. In Christ's name, amen.